All right. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for coming back to Bay Teeter's Day 8 of Intermediate Advanced Coding Camp in Java. We have an interesting lesson prepared for you today. So um, our agenda for today is we're going to be starting off with some review of bubble sort, right? the algorithm that we started yesterday. Um, and then after that, we will be going into a review of selection sort. Right. Um, after that, we'll be going into um, an introduction about your project. And um, yeah, and that will be basically it for today. So the first thing we'll be going over is the bubble sort review, right, from yesterday. And um, if you do remember, bubble sort works by, you know, looping through all the indexes in an array. And, you know, if the element at that current position is greater than the element to the right of it, right, greater than the element that's next to it. Um, um, then those two will be swapped and then it'll continue to do that loop um, until it finishes one pass and then it'll move on to the next pass for which it'll repeat that for the rest of the indexes. So on the right, we have a little bit of a, we have a small table on the right. So um, if you look here, this is sort of what we will start with, right, for the array. Um, and as you can see, the first thing we will be doing is starting at index zero and then we'll compare, you know, four and one. And since four is you know, and, and yeah, remember this is pass one, right? So this is pass one. So since four is greater than one, four and one will be swapped. Then it'll look at, yeah, so then four will be swapped. Then we look at the next next thing, right? Um, in the same pass, still in pass one, uh, four and three will be compared, right? So since four is greater than three, four and three will be swapped. Then we go down, then we see, then we'll compare four and two. And since four is greater than two, then four will be swapped with two. As you can see, we've, we've went through one full pass of the array, which means we've reached the end of the array. Then what we will do is now we know that four is completely sorted, right? Since it's at the end of the array, four is completely sorted. Um, and now that four is completely sorted, there is no need for us to include four as part of the unsorted array. That's why um, four will now be on, like not considered anymore, which basically means that, um, as you'll see in the next slide when we show you the code, um, now what will happen is that the program will now only consider the unsorted part of the array, basically meaning that it will only consider from index zero to two instead of from index zero to three. So this is right here in from index zero to three, right? Um, but after four is sorted and four is final, then we'll then it'll only start then it'll only start looking from index zero to two. So from zero, one, two, right? So now we again start back from zero, then we'll compare one and three. So now we know okay, one is less than three, or you can say three is greater than one. So um, there will be no swap, right? So this is, since it's nothing to swap there, one is correct. Then they'll compare three and two, right? And since three is greater than two, three will be swapped with two. Therefore you get one, two, three like that. Um, and that's the end of the pass. And now you might expect, okay, we're done, right? We got one, two, three, four. However, this is why, this is one of the reasons why bubble sort is inefficient is because even though, right, the array is still sorted, the program just keeps iterating until it, it completes the total number of passes and until there's only one item left in the unsorted array. So now we'll go back to pass three, right? Since we finished this entire pass, we'll go down to pass three. As you noticed, three is fully sorted. So now that's going to join the sorted data. And now, we'll, now in terms of the program, the program will now only be looking at indexes zero and one. So now, we just, now we compare indexes zero and one, two is greater than one, so there is no swap. So then that's the same, that completes, that completes there and now two will be moved on to the sorted data and one is left and since there's only one um, item left that is unsorted right um, that basically means that the array has been completed completely sorted um, and therefore you have completed bubble sort so this is sort of how it works through passes um Arian, do you have any um any questions about how the pass works if you'd like me to clarify anything Okay, cool. So now um, I believe yesterday, uh, sorry, on Wednesday's class, we didn't have the opportunity to look at the bubble sort code. So this is sort of what the code looks like for bubble sort, right? So um, as you can see, we created a bubble sort method, right? In which we are passing in an int array. So this is sort of how you would implement it, right? So um, you could go and call, like you can just create as many arrays as you want. You can just say bubble sort of this or bubble sort of this. That's sort of how you can create this. So if you look at the code, aspect, 
we create uh, a variable called int, so int n, right? That is um, initialized to the array length, right? To the length of the full array. Then we have a for loop, right? That iterates from i equals zero all the way to n minus one. And i is essentially the, the pass number, right? Um, i basically, like, it's, it's called a pass number because if you remember from here, you know how we have pass one, pass two, pass three? And so that's basically the goal of i. So i will basically be the pass number, it'll be, it'll be delegating the pass, right? It'll be, okay, this is pass one. Okay, this is pass two and so on. And the reason why it's n minus one is as you, as you will see down here, um, which I'll show you in a little bit, is just to like prevent out of bound exceptions because um, another big thing that we'll be doing here is we'll be looking at, like our index will actually be like, for, like our i and j, like as you can see here, we have j plus one, right? So j plus one is the next index. So what can happen is, if you went all the way to n or you went all the way to the end of the array and you said, and you wanted to check if there was a plus one, that'd give you an out of bounds exception, right? Because there's no element past the length of the array. So in order to prevent that, um, we want to dock our limit down by one so that if you add plus one, right, at the maximum limit, the maximum limit from here will go to one index less than the, than the maximum index in the array. So by doing a plus one at that less, and on that one less index, then the plus one will just equate to the final index instead of going over that final index. So that's why we have a minus one there because we'll be doing plus ones um, later in our code. So this is sort of what the first for loop line is, right? So i is less than n minus one, i is iterating. So that's the pass number. Then we move on to a second for loop, we have a nested for loop in here, that is j. And j is basically focused on the unsorted items in this array. So j is gonna be less than n minus i minus one and j is gonna keep incrementing. And the reason why it's n minus i minus one is because it's gonna be focusing on the unsorted items, which um, we'll actually get to in just a bit. So as you can see, after this is done, we will now see that an, an if statement, right? So if is, so if r of j, right? Um, assuming that we're in the first pass and that j is zero, if r of j, right, is greater than r of j plus one, meaning that if the, um, element at the zeroth index, if that is greater than the element at the second index or the next index, right, moving on, then we want to go and swap them, right? We, we want a way to go and swap them. So that's the, main, that's the main logic. And as you can see here, we employ the same logic, right? So you see here is if four is greater than one, then we want to swap it. And that's what we do moving on. And that's, that's, that's basically what we're doing in the if statement, right? So if r of j is greater than r of j plus one, we want to go and find a way to swap it. And to go ahead and swap it, what we're doing is we're, we're setting a temporary value called int temp, and um, you'll see how this works. So int temp is set to r of j. So here, int temp is basically set to four here, all right? So int temp is set to four, if you look at the previous example, and then r of j, meaning that um, j is equal to zero in this case, right? So then we're saying r of j means, means r of zero, right? The array at the zeroth index where four is right now will now be equal to r of j plus one meaning that we're setting the zeroth index of this equal to whatever is at the first index, right? J plus one, whatever there's R of one. So here we'll be saying R of zero is equal to R of one. So now we're setting the value of four to one. So now we're actually setting the value of four to one. That's basically swapping. But then if we set the value of four, right? If we have these two things, if we set the value of four to one, then what happens to the one over here? That's why we have the temp value Therefore, we set r of one, right? r of j plus one, if you assume j is zero, we set r of one equal to temp. And as you can see, temp as we stored earlier was r of j earlier, right? And r of j earlier was four. That's why we use the temp value here. That's the, that's the additional variable that we have. Because if we did not use this temp value and we said, if we just did not use temp value at all, and then we just said r of j is equal to r of j plus one, then r of j would, would become the valued r of one. And then if we say r of j plus one is, is and, and then if you say r of one is equal to r of j, but the r of, r of j value is already changed. So we need to find a way to store the previous j value in some object, in some um, variable so that we can access that later on. So that's why we use the temp um, variable over here. Okay, does that make sense? Hopefully that made like, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so that's basically how bubble sort of works. And once again, the main goal um, as you can see here, um, if we'll go back, is that, um, as you can see, the greatest number is always going to be filled out to the end, right? No matter how your, you know, your, your um, array is laid out, 
um, after each pass, right, you're gonna have the greatest number at the end and so on like that. And that's why if we look at this n minus i minus one part, what it's doing is um, it's not creating another array. Don't, don't, don't get confused like that. It's, it's in the same array except it's focus point. So beginning, it, it goes from n minus i minus one. So essentially it's going from n minus zero minus one. So it's going up to index um, zero. If it's, like, if it's like here, if it's four, one, three, two, it's zero, one, two, three, that's indexes. It'll go from zero to three, right? So that, that's its current um, look at right now, right? So its current thing is only looking from here. Right, that's what that's what it first looks at. So then that's the n minus i minus one, right? Because it's n minus one. Since here i is zero, because this is zero to pass or the first pass that we see here. Then after this pass is done, right, um, i increments, right? As you saw, i will increment, and then the new n minus i minus one will now only focus on these. Uh, will now only focus on indexes from zero to two, right? Which is why it goes from zero to two here. So basically what it does is now it's only focusing on these ones, right? Um, yeah, so beginning it focuses on all of these, right? Then it focuses on these ones, right? As you can see here, and then the n minus one, my minus one happens again after the second pass, then we'll only focus on these guys and then we'll focus on this guy. So essentially the focus range is just decreasing each time because it already knows that everything past that focus range is already sorted. That's the point of the n minus i minus one. Okay. Um, Going to move those annotations. Okay, yeah, so that's basically bubble sort. Um, I know we went we went over that in detail on Wednesday, but this was, this was just like a small review. So today we'll be talking about selection sort. So selection sort is um, another sorting algorithm, um, and um, it's more efficient than um, bubble sort in the way that it, it uses less swaps, um, but it sort of employs a similar strategy um, in that it makes multiple passes through the array to sort of get the whole sorting thing done. So basically how selection sort of works, and I think it's a much easier, I would say, sorting algorithm to grasp and sort of understand. So it starts at index zero, right? And it loops through the entire array and it, and it finds the smallest number, right? It's more practical, right? So you have an array, it starts at index zero and looks through the entire array and finds the smallest value. Once it finds that smallest value, it, sw it swaps that smallest value with the index at index zero. That's basically what it does. So as you can see here in step one, it looks for the smallest value in this array and it happens to be two, which is the smallest value. So then it'll go and swap seven and two. And then you know that at index zero, index zero is fully sorted, right? Cause you know that the element, at, cause then we know that the element at index zero is done, right? It's fully sorted. Then what it'll do is, um, and as you can see, it only makes one swap per pass. Unlike bubble sort, right? Bubble sort makes swaps every time, like multiple times in one pass, right? Um, you know, bubble sort compares two and swaps that and then compares the next one, swaps that, swaps, swaps, swaps. However, here in selection sort, what it does is um, it just looks for one value, right? The smallest value each time and takes that small value and swaps it with the index zero or the first index, okay? So as you can see, step one, what it does, it finds two and swaps that with seven. And I think seven went to the end. And this is basically what your thing at the end of um, step one is, your first pass. So then, since the program knows, okay, so zero, right, the, the, the element at index zero is now completely sorted, it's, it's correct. So then, now its focus will now only shift to the next three. So similarly, how in bubble sort, I talked about the focus range shifting from the end this way. So in bubble sort, the focus range decreases from the, the, the largest index to the smallest index. However, however, in selection sort, the, um, the focus range swift, uh, shifts from the smaller index to the biggest index, okay? So as you can see now, that it knows that index zero is fully sorted. So now I'm gonna start looking at index one. So now it says, okay, index one is five. Is there any other um, element in the array that has a smaller number than five, All right? And then it finds, oh, okay, four is smaller than five. So it's gonna swap four and five, end of pass. So now four and five have been swapped. Therefore, four joins the sort the sorted group, and that's the end of the pass. Then you move on to step three. And now its focus range is now only focused on the last two indexes. So it only focused on five and seven. So here we can, okay, let's go and compare five and seven. Five is, is correct, right? Because five is still less than seven. So therefore, five gets added to this one, to the sorted array, as you can see here. And then goes down to the last one. 
it's like, okay, let's compare two, four, and five. Okay, then let's, let's just go and compare the last one. Since there's only one element left, now, okay, the array is sorted, and therefore you get your full sorted array. So the, 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 the main, um, you know, uh, basically what selects and sort is doing is, it's just looking through the entire array in one pass. It finds the smallest, um, it finds the index of the smallest element, um, and then it swaps that with the starting, um, with, with like the first value in that array or in that minimized or focus ranged array. So does that make sense to you? Okay, cool. So now let's go and take a look at the code. Um, yeah, so as you can see here, we have a, um, the code for how selection sort works. So we start off, right, once again, it's a void method. It's not returning anything, right? And we're just sorting the array. We can print this out after if you want to. Um, and once again, we're taking in an array as the parameter. So here we're saying int n is equal to array.length. And um, that's just to like help you bring your for loop, okay? Um, and then we have a for loop over here. We say for int i equal to zero, i is less than n minus one, i plus plus. Um, and once again, that's, that sort of delegates your pass. And then we find, and then once again, we set the min index, right? The smallest index. So what that smallest index is, is basically, is it index zero? The min index is basically the starting index of the new focus range array. So here, right, when you first start off, the min index is zero. After this first pass, the min index becomes one. Then the min index becomes two. The min index becomes three, all right? So you can sort of see how the, how the min index sort of changes. So the min index is basically the starting index of the new focused array. So that's why min index is equal to i, right? As I said, i is equal to the pass. So when i is zero, the min index is zero, right? After the first pass, i is going to be equal to one, so the min index is not going to be one. And then once we you know, say, okay, this is what the min index is, then we create another for loop, right? And then inside of that for loop, um, uh, we say j equals i plus one, which is basically the next element in that array, right? i plus one. So if i, if I is equal to zero, then j is equal to one. So we're comparing zero and one. Okay, uh, and then we're saying if r of j is less than r of min index, min index is equal to j. So what this is doing is if, if you look back here, j is equal to i plus one. So we're saying if, you know, if five is less than seven, right? Um, you know, if, if five is less than seven, then we wanna go ahead and set the min index to seven or, or, or yeah, so we want to go and set the min index to seven. And what that's doing is as you're moving along, it says, okay, so now this is the new minimum, but it's going to keep on going. Cause right now as you see, okay, five is less than seven. So it looks like five is the smallest number now, but then it's going to go again. It is four less than five. Okay. Now four is the smallest number now. What about two? Is two less than four? Okay. Now it looks like two is the smallest number now. So then you finally realize that by using that strategy, right? By, by saying min index is equal to that, we can sort of see that, okay, now we know that this, you know, whatever element we end up landing on, that is now the smallest index. So that's just a way of you changing your minimum throughout the array until you get the absolute minimum. Okay. So now after you find the absolute minimum, which is after you complete the entire pass, after you look through the entire array, then we want to go ahead and swap the found minimum element, right? With the first element. So the min index will keep on changing, right? Because the, the min index will never stay constant. It's gonna keep on changing because it's gonna keep finding the, 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 the smallest element in that unsorted array. So once you find that unsorted, the smallest element, then we're gonna go down to this code here. As you can see, this code is outside of the second for loop, okay? This is after we find the minimum element. Then once again, we're gonna do the same swapping mechanism as we discussed in bubbles, so the same idea. So int temp is equal to r of min index, meaning that int temporary is equal to the array of that index. So as you can see, if you look here, the index of two here is zero, one, two, is three. Two is at the third index. So basically temp is now gonna be equal to two since it's the array of the third index. So min index is equal to three. And then um, I here is equal to zero because we're in the first pass right now. So um, in temp is equal to array of three, which is two. So int temp is equal to two. Then we say array of min index, right? right? Array of min index is equal to array of i meaning that now what that's doing is it's again swapping these two, right? So now array of three is now gonna be equal to array of zero. So then we're gonna go and swap, right? So now 
array of three is now going to be equal to seven. And then now finally, we're going to say array of i is equal to temp, meaning that array of zero, right, since i is zero in this case, will be equal to temp, which is two. Therefore, we've gone and swapped seven and two. That's sort of how this code works. So one thing to keep in mind is that this min index, its main purpose is to find that the index of the smallest element. And after you find the index of the smallest element in that array, then you go ahead and use your swing swapping mechanism. And then after you implement this, right, as you can see, then it goes back up to the top of the loop, then i increments to one, which means you're on the second pass. Since i is equal to one here, i will now be, so now since i is equal to one, that's only gonna start looking on from the first index onwards. So that sort of creates your separation. Yeah, so that's sort of how the selection, the selection sort uh, code works. Do you have any questions? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so that's basically um, all of bubble sort and, sl and selection sort. So the last thing we're gonna be covering today is the project overview. Um, so the project is, um, as we mentioned in the beginning of this course, we wanted um, to sort of have all of you to you know, walk away with some end product, right? That you learned from this camp. Um, and the project will basically, basically encompass everything that you were taught during this camp. So there'll, there'll not be anything that you did not you know, learn. Um, and um, the project is going to be started. Uh, so the project is assigned today um, and it will be due prior to next Friday's session. So um, we'll be sending a submission link soon um, for that project. So we recommend that you submit it prior to next Friday's session so we can do reviews and, and all of that. So now I'm navigating onto the project prompt. So, okay. So your project prompt um, for this camp will be to develop a student management database. Um, so the main scenario, right? So the scenario that you're in for this problem is that you are a database administrator for a university um, and you need to create an application, right? That can manage student enrollments and their current balance. Um, and your application should be able to do the following. Your application should ask the user, right? how many students need to be added to the database? Basically saying, how many students need to be added to the school or to the university? Um, then the user will go ahead and enter this many students. After that, the user will be prompted to enter the name and year of each student. So let's say they said five students, then five times it'll ask you the name and the year. And each time it asks you if to enter a new name and a new year, right? Um, make, sure you have some form of, make sure you have some form of validation to make sure that you know, the same name and year is not entered twice. Right. So if, if you say like 10 students and you have to enter the name in your 10 times, a different, a different name in your for each of the 10 students. Now, after, you know, you enter it for each of those 10 students, or sorry, after you enter it for um, each of the 10 students, then um, the user will now be given, you know, a list or of some sort, however, however you'd want to handle it um, of the student's five digit unique ID. So each student will, after you enter their name and year and all that stuff, um, they should be automatically assigned by the program. The program should generate a five digit unique ID um, for, the, for, the, for each individual student with that first number, right, of that ID um, being that student's year in college. So, so let's say the student is a second year, like a third year in college, then um, the, num the starting number of the five digit ID should be whatever the number. So if they're third year, then starting, the starting number for the five digit unique ID should be three. If they're a first year, it should be, the, the starting digit should be one and so on. So that's sort of how it works. So for example, sort of have your, so if we have a student named John Doe, is year second, this, this is what the user would enter. And then their five digit ID should be automatically assigned to them by the program. So that it's two, three, eight, two, three, eight, two, five, because it starts with two because John is a second year, as you can see here. Next, after, you know, they, they um, you know, um, enter all the names and the ID is given back right, for each one of the students, then the student should, then the, then the user, right, should be able to enroll each one of the students into one or more of the following courses. So um, one way we can do this is, you know, by just printing out the names of each of these courses and just saying like, if the user enters this letter, it'll enroll him this course and so on. So find a way um, to enroll that person or assign that person, you know, how many courses these are. And as you can see, 
we're dealing, we're dealing with multiple stuff here, right? So this should, this should most likely be stored in, in an array list of some sort, right? Something that can expand. So, so one of the attributes of, of the student could be his courses, right? His course list, which would be in, in an array list or something. So after he's enrolled in these courses, um, the student should also be able to view their own balance, right? So how much money they have in their balance. And when they enroll in the courses, each course costs $600. So when they enroll in the course, you should, auto should automatically charge their balance $600 for each course that they enroll in. Um, and based on that, the, the student should be able to, to, you know, view their own balance and see, okay, how much money am I being charged? And they should, you know, therefore be able to pay that money. So, you know, you can just have like a pay. So have, have like a pay method. So, you know, you can prompt the user, how much money would you like to pay? He can like pay, I want to pay $1,200 because they enrolled in two courses and something like that. All right. Um, and students should be basically able to view their balance and pay that tuition accordingly that they were assigned by the course. Um, and to see an overall student status, you know, if they say, give me the student status, it should go ahead and the user should be able to see the student name, his year, his ID, his courses, and his balance. All right, so this is sort of your project. So just to develop a student management database. Once again, this is all the information you'll be provided. And the reason why you, know, you might be, oh, it's, it's, it's very minimal, right? And the reason why is because this is one of, you know, the important skills of problem solving is that um, the less information you're given, right, that sort of helps you become more creative and helps you, you know, design your own solution. And that's what we're, we are really looking forward to is, um, seeing all the creative solutions that you guys can come up with um, and we're really in interested in seeing all of that. So this is all the information you have. Um, this will be linked in the slides. So yeah, so your goal is to build a, is to build a student management database um, that should just include all the following. And once again, all this should be through user input. So all these questions, all these prompts should all utilize the scanner class, just as a small hint. All right, so do you have any questions regarding this? Assignment, I can go ahead and clarify any of them if you have any. Do you have any questions or are you, are you good? Okay, cool. Yeah, so um, once again, this thing should be um, completed. I highly recommend that you get started on this this weekend. Um, and if you have any questions, you know, coming on along with this project or any clarifications or any, if you're like stuck somewhere, um, just feel free to shoot us an email and we'll be right there to help you. So that concludes today's session. Um, you can go ahead and access the worksheet at tinyroll.com slash intermediate worksheet eight. Um, we have one sorting problem there for you um, with selection sort, and then we also have some coding bad problems for you for this weekend. So go ahead and complete that worksheet and submit it through the same submission link. And we highly, rec and we highly recommend that you get started on the project um, and you know, shoot us an email if you have any questions. Um, we'll also be sending out the submission link for that project, uh, project soon. So stay tuned for that. All right, yeah, so thank you so much for joining us for day eight of Intermediate Advanced Coding Camp in Java, and we look forward to seeing you all um, on day nine.